I am so excited for this episode. I have always been fascinated with stories of survival and the search and rescue involved. And to hear what these guys go through, it just says so much about the heart and dedication of a search and rescue team. Yeah, and not only that, but they also connect with the community through outreach programs, you know, teaching preparedness, uh, for example, at REI Knoxville. Um, you know, it's about good decision making and mitigating risk. And these are the types of people with a mindset of mental and emotional toughness thriving in and enjoying the harsh, arduous environments. After talking to these guys, it really grew the respect that I have for people that do a job like this. Let's get to it. Welcome to the First Planet Adventures podcast. Super excited for our guests today, uh, but first I'd like to paint a little picture here. So imagine hiking through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, surrounded by vibrant green, thick vegetation. You look out through the trees and see only the dense fog moving through like smoke. Enthralled by the beauty and eerie ambience of the environment, you never see the roots sticking up out of the ground, catching the toe of your boot. You tumble head first off the trail. When you come to, the trail's nowhere in sight. You can't put weight on your foot, so you're not hiking out on your own. You're disoriented. You have no coverage on your cell phone. But the good news is that you let your spouse know when to expect to hear from you. So there is some hope of someone coming to help you. Today we have Andrew Harrington, founder and team leader of BUSAR, Beck Country Unit Search and Rescue, and with him is Matt Jernigan, BUSAR's assistant team leader. BUSAR is an all-hazard search and rescue team operating the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and the National Park System. Andrew's vision to create BUSAR came from almost two decades of search and rescue experience in the Smokies, wildlife ranger, wildland firefighter, and former backcountry law enforcement ranger. Andrew uses these experiences along with his backcountry teaching wilderness survival and safety to forge this highly dedicated team. He was recently recognized for the creation of the team with the National Park Search and Rescue Award and for his role in the Gatlinburg Firestorm the Department of Interior Valor, Valor Award, and the Tennessee Conservation Hero Award. Matt, he has over 25 years of outdoor experience, backpacking, mountain biking, trail running, and adventure racing. Matt has summited Kilimanjaro, trekked Kenya, Australia, New Zealand, and several Central American countries. Having grown up in East Tennessee, he has a deep knowledge of the Appalachian Mountains. He also serves on the board of Harvest Field Ministries Haiti, and Experience Your Smokies. Welcome, Andrew and Matt. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you. Oh, thanks for being taking the time out of your busy schedule. Absolutely. So, Busar, what does All Hazards Rescue Team mean? So All Hazard means swift water, technical rescue. All of our members have uh, an extensive outdoor experience. Um, everything, our skill set and exclusives of of man tracking, um, off trail travel, land navigation, medical, everything. So by all hazards, we mean we operate in any, any environment. It would be swift water, arduous carry outs, inclement weather, and then technical rescue. So pretty much the whole gambit of um, any, any outdoor adventure within the Smoky Mountain area. Yes, in fact, we thrive on that. What, um, what outside agencies do you work with and cross train with? Yeah. So, uh, the first thing I'd want to say is that we are an outside agency ourselves. And so the Smoky Mountains has a, their own search and rescue team. And so if you think about like the army, there's the regular army, then the, the army reserves. And that's how I kind of describe our team is that when the Rangers need backup, when they, um, you know, when it's a holiday weekend, there's, there's tons of people in the park and they're spread a little thin. Uh, when there's incidents, then that's when we come in to help them. So first and foremost, the, the Smokies has their own search and rescue team, and we're here to supplement them. 
Uh, so we are an outside agency. And then, um, you know, we worked with Blount County Rescue Squad before. We worked with Haywood County um, Rescue Squad before. We've got a good relationship with all the local agencies. You know, some of these bigger incidents that happen, everybody comes in and it's all just one big team. And so that's how we try and look at it is that when we're up here, we're part of the Smokies Rescue Team. Um, so even though we are an outside agency, uh, we fold in, we're all working together to accomplish the mission. So could you give our listeners a little bit of more in-depth idea of what your capabilities are? I noticed um, when I was doing some research that you guys list canine, uh, perhaps drone. Um, we talked about briefly about um, mountain rescue, water, swift water rescue. I also noticed there's like uh, you guys responded and assisted with a plane crash. Um, situation at one point. Um, what other type of capabilities do you guys have? Yeah, so I, I can just run down real quick. You know, primarily when we developed the team is for the, uh, you know, off trail rescues and searches. And that came from my experience here in the park. Uh, you know, my other uh, job for a lot of long, you know, current job here as well in the Smokies is as a hog hunter in the park. And so always working off trail um, on these, when someone went missing, they'd always pull the hog hunters in because we're very familiar with the back country and tend to be in good shape to handle those type of missions. And so that's when I was like, Hey, well, what if we recruited outdoor athletes to help supplement um, this type of stuff? So originally we were designed for off trail rescue. And then the chief ranger at the time said, well, Hey, what about looking at helping us with technical rescue? And then it kind of progressed into swift water rescue. And then as we built the team, uh, we got a down plane specialist on the team, Jeff Wadley, who wrote uh, Mayday Mayday about the plane crashes in the Smokies. And so as the team grew, we had more and more capabilities and we just started to help fill other niches uh, in the park. But winter rescue, all our guys, uh, they go to winter rescue classes up in North Carolina. Um, let's see, swift water, we just trained swift water not too long ago, technical rescue. Uh, so that's all your um, low angle, steep angle, high angle type rescues. Uh, medical, you know, we've got a, a couple of physicians on the team now. We have um, paramedics, EMT, advanced EMTs, EMTBs, um, one VA. So we've got a pretty good um, broad range of medical skills on the team. Um, I'm trying to think else, what are we missing? Uh, we do have a, a canine unit on the team, uh, Ben Lankammer and Cato. And so, He's working with Cato to get him where he's, uh, um, you know, ready to be deployed in the field as far as searching. And then we looked into the drone um, aspect. We brought a guy on for the drone stuff, but then we tied in with uh, ORNL and they've got a really good drone program out there. And so uh, we've been, they've been used on the Clements. Sorry, we brought the, the Oak Ridge guys in for that. ORNL is Oak Ridge National Labs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they got a phenomenal program and, you know, their budget far exceeds ours. And so they've got a bigger, <laughs> better. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Important aspect of what we do is we, we cross train all of our members. So everyone has a, has a, has a basic skill set on, on all areas. Yeah. And so what Matt's talking about there is, um, so we can use an example on that is, um, you know, one of our, you know, we've got, an example would be Anthony, who's our swift water instructor. You know, he's also guides on the Gali, guides on the Pigeon River, big time boater. And so his, his primary specialty is swift water. But what we train Anthony in is tracking. We train him in, you know, survival. We train him in medical. Well, he's already an advanced EMT. But, uh, you know, we just cross the board because we want, you know, when you get a uh, BUSAR team member up here, you know, we want to have a standardized platform of skill sets. And so we kind of follow the national park model on that, you know, um, our ultimate goal would be to have everyone SRT2, which is search and rescue two, uh, technician two, uh, swift water two, uh, technical rescue two and EMTB. So we would have all the, um, you know, ground pounders as we call them uh, wow. across the skill sets. And when you, when you talk about the certification levels, who is the certification through? Is that through the National Park Search and Rescue Organizations? Yes, yeah, so we follow the National Park uh, guidelines on the Search and Rescue Technician, the Swift Water Technicians, and the Technical Rescue Technicians. Uh, the uh, emergency medicine stuff is going through the National Registry as far as EMTs and paramedics. I actually read uh, one of the posts from your Facebook when you were recruiting uh, new members and it was 
experienced outdoor athletes wanted for hazardous work, no wages, long hours, adverse weather, high level of fitness required, honor and recognition in case of success. What would drive someone to want to join a team like that? And uh, same question for each of you, you know, what drove you to want to do this? Yeah, I can answer that because I created that, um, that flag. <laughs> Have you ever seen Shackleton's post uh, in the paper when he was uh, preparing? For, that's where I stole that from. And so I just, yeah. yeah. Um, and so basically what we're looking for people is, you know, and Matt's a great example because he was the first person that I recruited. He came through my survival class and a ranger had told me um, about Matt, who was an adventure racer and into, you know, stuff like that. And I said, hey, man, would you be interested in starting a search and rescue team? And his eyes lit up, you know. And so, you know, when there's a certain, I would say it's a, almost like a breed of a person that when you tell them that, hey, you're going to be uncomfortable, you're going to be miserable, you know, you're going to face all these type of challenges, um, you know, so that you can help someone else out. Like there's a certain breed of people that, you know, it's like a moth to a flame that's, that's like their column. That's, you know, what they're, they're bred for in that regard. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I mentioned earlier about our, our team members, you know, thrive, really, really do thrive on that. Um, I think all of us have, have come together. I mean, in my, in my background, even prior, prior to Boussars, mountain biker doing some you know, ultra endurance events. I mean, there's, there's those times where you really, really, it's really painful. Um, and the same is true in some of our, some of our missions, whether, you know, you're pushing up, um, steep mountain crawling through rhododendron and cold miserable weather but there, there's something in doing that that is just is so rewarding and with Busar, I, I see that amplified in the camaraderie that forms amongst amongst the team um and that that brotherhood or sisterhood if you will either or brotherhood you know gender gender neutrally there meaning but um we it, it's, it's just a it's a great experience yeah, and from a from a uh, you know a story that I think about when Austin Bohannon went missing over on the south end of the southwest end of the park, there was one uh, moment that we were searching a drainage and we were crawling through the rhododendron and we were making about a half mile an hour. It was just miserably hot, you oh. know, a half mile an hour crawling through rhododendron. One of our guys got um, heat exhaustion, and so it was, and we were you know, we were only halfway through our mission. And so it was just like, you know, make or break, like for that guy, but it's like, he came back, you know, so it's just like the, you know, just that, that suffering together, you know, breeds that or it fosters that relationship, you know, you suffer together, the bonds definitely get stronger. We have a really cohesive team. And one of those is, you know, Matt and I first started, you know, five years ago, uh, we, started meeting on Tuesday nights at the park up in Maryville to work out together. And, and it's, it's been every Tuesday for five years that our team gets together and works out together and just tries to make each other miserable with workouts. Uh, and then like, that's the glue to our team. I keep on saying that to new recruits. I'm like, you can't make workouts. I was like, you know, we don't want you here because this is the glue to our team. That's it. And one, one other aspect to it is, all of us, by recruiting outdoor athletes, all of us love to be outdoors anyway. I mean, we have, you know, I'm a mountain biker, mountain, bi uh, mountain biker and backpacker, and we have paddlers and we have climbers. And, and this, is, this is stuff we'd be doing on the weekends anyway, or during, during the week. You know, so I'm, I'm already recreating in the park anyway. You know, I'm already, already here. So why not come up and just have the opportunity to do this and help people out? Yeah, I think that last part is, is key is when you combine – like, I think everyone has a different reason for being on the team, but the, the common, the commonality in there is that they, that service to others, you know, being able to help someone out their darkest hour. I think that's, that's, uh, you know, that would be the common thing because some people, you know, um, you know, it's about the brotherhood and some people, they just want adventure and some people it's, Oh, this is a challenge, but, you know, there's that underlying thing is like, hey, yeah, I want to help people, you know, and this is a, an aspect that I can give back to the community and uh, make it a better. Yeah. What, what I hear you saying is um, there's a certain amount of being comfortable with being uncomfortable or embracing the suck um, and, you know, having fostering a never quit spirit because you're out there to actually help people who need or in serious need of help. 
but also doing it in service to other folks. That's pretty powerful. You know, I always made the argument is like, you know, the reason, you know, a lot of times, you know, when we were developing our fitness standards, you know, we made them very challenging and, and higher than what the park service would actually require of us. Because once again, you know, why do people want to be in like an uh, elite special forces unit? You know, a lot of it, part of it is the challenge, you know, it's, you know, they want to, they want to raise their themselves to that bar and, and, and get over that bar. And, you know, there's a certain type of people that, you know, if you set the bar high, they will, they will go for that bar. You know, that's what we look for in our, our members. So we know there's a lot of physical prep work uh, that y'all put in, physical training. How does someone prepare to be on a team like this mentally and emotionally? In my mind, for me, I think the, the, the mental aspect, I'll touch upon the emotional aspect, the, moment, the, men, the mental aspect is part of, come, comes with the training. Um, it's really a, a byproduct. Because when you are, as an example, when you're in rhododendron for miles on end and you're just getting, getting beaten down and you do get beaten down in the rhododendron um, and it's physically challenging. But in that, 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 that toughens that mental, build that mental fortitude as, as well. Uh, you know, it's, maybe that's the way I'm wired, but we, I think we all just, you know, we, we push through that and those, those hard times that just, that just like any other muscle, you know, that mental attitude we're, we're working out when we're when we're really doing something physically strenuous. And, and, and speaking to the, the the emotional strength, you know, we probably all all handle things differently. Um, things we've seen and and, and, and witnessed. Um, I don't know. I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, that's something we really train can can train for, or is something that we all handle differently. Yeah. I mean, I guess um, the preparation mentally, I would say when we target recruits it's about finding the right people for me. And so I typically look for someone who's had at least 10 years outdoor experience um, because I know they're, they've had, um, you know, they've matured in their outdoor um, sport, whatever that may be. And, and I say that because, you know, like the first time, the first rescue I was ever involved in was my own rescue, right? And so I got a plate in my head from a rock climbing accident and I got rescued when I was 17, 18. And so, you know, when you're a 17, 18 year old male um, and 19, 20 and stuff, you may be perfectly physically capable to be on this team, but uh, you know, you're still running on a testosterone, like as far as making, uh, you know, rash decision, decisions, you know, like I want, I want that. Um, and, you know, we've got some younger, you know, uh, younger males on our team that are in their mid twenties and stuff, but they're extremely mature because they've been doing this stuff since they're 12 years old. And so they understand the risks, you know, of paddling class five white water or climbing and all that kind of stuff. And so for me, the, the first mental part is that they're bringing that to the table, hopefully when they come in the door, uh, as far as the emotional aspect. Yeah. I mean, we've seen a lot of different, you know, uh, gruesome endings to, um, incidents and I think those those all play you can't unsee something and I think they all play play into a role and I think just the the closeness of our, of our team and just checking in on each other and you know the park's really good they've got critical incident stress management if we have a big event that involves uh, fatalities um, especially kids or anything like that then they offer the critical incident stress management to to our members uh, which is is crucial um, but yeah I would think that the the emotional aspect, um, you know, we just check in like every time we work out together you know, before we start and we got anything to share and kind of check in. If someone, hopefully everyone realizes that our, our team is a safe enough place that if you're, if you're struggling with something on a recent mission that you can, you can air it out. We're all there for you and we'll come to, come to help. You know, we've got a guy that's deployed in Kosovo. An example of that right now, one of our guys is deployed in Kosovo right now and our team goes in Moses yard you know, what, every week or so, every, every week. And he's been, he's been over there for, you know, over six months now. And so that's just, that's just an example of the team coming together to support each of us when we need each other. Can you tell us about some of the arduous physical tests that you put people through? Uh, 
just curiosity, what your Cobra fitness test or the uh, National Park Service pack test? Well, any new recruit too, we do require, even before they get to the fitness test, we do require that they take um, various classes on um, DS, which is the instant, instant control system. Instant command. I'm sorry, instant, instant command system. And that was developed by, by FEMA over the years and some other prerequisite aviation safety, things of that nature. But um, the way it works, works, a recruit will come and work out with us for, for, for uh, four weeks, four weeks in a row, get to know them a little bit, um, get to know, you know who, who they are, them, us as well, make sure they're a good fit. And then we start the, the Cobra Fit test. <laughs> um, the, pers- the first part of the Cobra Fit test is the, the arduous pack duty test. And this is, a, this is a National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service standard. And that is um, covering three miles with a 45 pound pack in 45 minutes. And you're not, not allowed to run in that. And it's, and it's pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. So that's, that is the first component of it. And then afterwards to what we do is we add in it to that. We do an up and over picnic tables with a 45 pound kettlebell and our SAR pack for an additional 30 minutes. And that, that mimics pretty, that mimics very well what it's like to carry a, uh, a patient in a litter in the Smokies is up and down, up and down uh, with that. So that's a, that's a really, really good test. Um, from there, we then move to our, what we call our, more my, my personal favorite, the burpee pack pull-ups. So it's a minimum of, so in that, that, that movement, you're doing, you're doing a full burpee with your SAR pack on, which typically weighs 17 to 20 pounds, by the way. And then you have to do, perform a pull-up. And we'll do uh, a minimum of 50 of those in, in 10 minutes. Ooh. The requirement. Certainly can do more if you like. But you know, <laughs> and then uh, after that, we'll do. Is it it's two thirty-five? Yeah, with the trap bar. It's fifty pounds. So it's two thirty. Two hundred thirty. Two thirty. Okay, and then fifteen reps of those in, in one minute. We have a a trap bar, which is a deadlift bar that you can actually get inside and simulates picking up a litter. And uh, so we set so the timer for one minute. You have to do a minimum of fifteen. And so all those, you know, they kind of sound like random tests, but, you know, it's kind of uh, the backstory behind those is back injuries are the number one uh, reported injury for search and rescue personnel in the National Park Service based upon like a 10-year study. And so, you know, our mindset, well, if someone can lift 230 pounds 15 times, uh, you know, it shows us that A, they've got good lifting form, B, uh, they're, they're you know, very strong. Uh, the largest patient I've ever had to carry out of the woods was over close to 400 pounds. And so, um, you know, the patients can be very large nowadays. Um, the burpee pack pull-ups, you know, what that simulates when you're crawling through road road, you may be crawling and then you're up and over something. So we're taking our body through the, the largest amount of range of motion we can all the way from the ground to above a pull-up bar. And so we're also testing lower body power, upper body power, uh, cardiovascular, but we're also saying, Hey, this sucks for 10 minutes. This is going to suck. You know, and can you make it through that 10 minutes? And then the, uh, up and overs on top of the pack test is showing that, um, incline decline, but also that kind of grip stuff. And that's just more of a mental, mental fatigue thing. Cause it, you know, you're, you're 20 minutes in and you're like, Oh my God, is it not over yet? You're carrying this. You can't set the kettlebell down. You can only switch it from hand to hand like you'd be carrying a litter and it, it that, that one it sounds like it'd be the easiest one but i think a lot of people are like wow that really sucked and, yeah. and it does <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, it, it does it's good though <laughs> um, it does mimic closely a lot of a lot of experience on on missions and an important thing to this too about our fitness tests not not just recruits so all of us every team member reapplies each year and that's a really another uh, maybe a unique unique to us as compared to most search and rescue teams. But that's really important because the fitness is very, very important for the types of missions we perform. And so by reapplying each year, you know, we, 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 there's no complacency. We always, we always keep strong. 
great. That, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, and like you said, there, there's a certain, there's a reason why you do these things. It's, it's not just, Hey, how much can you tolerate or how much can you, can you work, work through there? There's an actual objective to, to be measured here. That's great. Yes. Um, so earlier we, we had Casey uh, read a, a scenario of a hiker who was out, who tripped and um, maybe went unconscious, woke up um, on, off the trail, wasn't sure what to do. Um, so can you kind of walk us through your response? Like who, who initiates the call? Where do you guys, who, who calls Busar to activate you? Yeah. So in, in any type of, search and rescue there's the first phase of it's going to be investigation right so that's where the rangers are going to determine what where when why right and so in your scenario where um the hiker left a trip plan that call would come into 911 or if they had uh, our dispatch number they would call them and then that that would then get uh pushed out to a ranger in that district right so let's say it was uh, my husband was going hiking at LeConte and he didn't come back. Well, the first thing that's going to happen is um, the ranger may swing up to LeConte. We're going to try and find out what type of uh, vehicle they have. Is the vehicle still there or not? The vehicle's still there. Well, then there's a pretty good chance they may still be on trail. And so that, that's when um, it, it kind of depends. If it's just an overdue hiker, if it's something uh, getting a little bit more involved, there's a search urgency rating form. And that's where they pretty much assign a numerical number to you based upon your age, the type of gear you have, the, uh, the area that you're in, um, and the weather conditions as far as the level of urgency. Um, and so you have to think from a search manager's perspective, anytime we put people in the field, we're inducing, we're, incre we're um, uh, exposing them to risk. And so if it's midnight and it's snow and ice and sleeting and it's off trail um well putting personnel off trail in in you know icy snowy conditions at night is a pretty good chance that you're going to get a rescue or hurt so in that scenario if you are the hiker and you have the gear to make it out they're probably not going to put people off trail until the next day now they may do a hasty search that night on trail but anytime you step off trail you're increasing risk so that investigation phase is the first part. Um, if, you know, so this, the hiker fell, went off the trail. Um, so they, they tried to call 911 and they couldn't get out. Uh, from a instructor standpoint, I would say always try and dial 911, even if you don't have service. By law, a carrier is going to have to pick that call up and transmit it if you can get any type of carrier on that. Um, yeah, and so the report would come in either from a third party or typically a lot of times it can come in from a cell phone call or someone else on the trail saying, Hey, there's an injured person about three miles up the trail. Now, if they know the extent of the injuries, um, they can kind of start to see what type of resources they need. If, um, if they don't have the resources on duty that day, um, then they'll do a, a page out for um, a litter team. So in that scenario where it's just a simple, you know, go up, get the patient, load them in a litter and bring them down the trail, which is a pretty common one, uh, for, especially for the lower extremity, that's, uh, they're going to do a call out within the park service uh, to all the different divisions to see who's available. We also get texted and uh, other uh, people on the park services emergency uh, roster also get paid for that. And so everyone just comes together and meets at the trailhead. You say by a text whether you can respond or not. So that's a simple, that's a simple carry out scenario. So as far as education and trying to prevent some of these emergency situations, uh, you also do preventative search and rescue programs. Can you tell us a little bit more about your educational efforts in community outreach? Yeah, so we've done programs at REI, um, let's see, Three Rivers Market, a couple other places. Um, yeah, and so, you know, I can use, um, I don't want to use that example, but like on the back end of a incident, you know, we, we, we've had trackers, we've had drones, we've had ground teams, we've had um, aviation units, um, you know, and, and in, in a certain scenario, none of those things mattered, right? Because uh, the patient was already a fatality. 
And, but on the front end, if that patient had, um, you know, had a uh, certain mindset and certain, certain gear, well, then they wouldn't, we wouldn't have got to that point. So there's only so much on the back end that search and rescue teams can do. You know, and the best thing you can do as a, as a recreationist is do your part in the beginning to make yourself a better prepared or B, um, you know, easier to be rescued. Right. And so you mentioned leaving a trip plan. One of the biggest things that we tell everyone is, you know, the, then I can't, I can't ever think of anyone we've had to really go look for that's left a trip plan because typically they've, you know, the people that are very well prepared, you know, they've checked the weather, they've checked in the ranger station, they've, you know, probably been to REI and bought some good gear. You know, there's the, the people that go to that trouble typically do, um, don't get in those situations. The people that get in trouble, the people that come up and they're wearing flip flops and shorts and they buy the $1 trail map and they decide to hike up Leconte, they take the wrong turn. And then now it's dark. They're trying to navigate with their phone. The phone starts dying. The kids and the wife are screaming and, you know, everybody's mad and crying and scared. And that's, that's how it goes, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, the more you can do on the front end, the better off you are, you know, and that's, that's the purpose of those uh, PSAR programs. And, and in the program, what I typically do is I highlight uh, real world scenarios based upon uh, our experience, and then also uh, news feeds. And then I just break it down into mindset, skills, and gear. And so the mindset is a, just because you dial 911 doesn't mean that the rescuers are going to drop out of the helicopters and pick you up at that point in time. Like it's still your responsibility. And once you learn, you know, once you do a search urgency rating on yourself and you say, Oh, I'm probably going to spend the night out if I'm off trail, then people start to take it a little bit more seriously. The skills part, you know, we break that down into uh, three different categories, which covers 10 different catalysts in my book. And, you know, that's, that's medical, that's uh, like the bivouac scenario, spend the night out with minimal gear and bad weather, and then immersion type scenario. And then the gear, basically, uh, we just showcase the gear. You know, something as simple as a trash bag is a complete lifesaver. And so having, you know, um, you know like uh, a good plan as far as the things that are going to save your life. You know, I've taught, I have a business where I teach world of survival and, you know, I'll train you know, girls for that show Naked and Afraid and all this kind of stuff. But all those skills that are portrayed on TV and in survival books and magazines and stuff, that's not what you really need out there. You know, you need to be able to treat your injuries. You need to be able to stay warm. You need to be able to stay hydrated. And if you can do those three things, you got a pretty good chance of making it out. And so having the mindset, skills, and gear to accomplish that, that's, uh, that's it doesn't take that much, honestly. Matt, you got anything to weigh in on that one? Uh, just one thing, it's just somewhat related, but uh, it just struck me. I think there's something people don't realize that when they do get injured, it takes a long time before mm. uh, responders are able to, able to reach them. Um, I mean, easily, I think of some instances on, or just simple, maybe it's a injured, injured ankle, maybe broken wrist, things of that nature on, on Mount Lacan. Mount Lacan is one of the more popular uh, series of trails that go up there. Some of the more popular trails, one of the higher, higher mountains in this area. But anyway, I mean, it can easily take 17, 18 hours to get someone down. And so that's, you know, that's just a long time to be waiting or to be, I mean, not waiting, but to, to have an injury and essentially just waiting for the first responders and then being, being carried out. So it kind of goes back to what Andrew said, or uh, hinted to is the responsibility, you know, be able to take care of yourself um, until you do, until you are found or, or have care and get out. Yeah. And you don't really, and honestly, you don't have to be that far in. I mean, in classic cases, the waterfall guy that uh, True. we were on a month ago, you know, the guys, um, I mean, he was probably only a mile in, uh, but it took four hours to get him out. Right. And so we ended up having to fly him cause he was critical, but, the, the helicopter couldn't fly because of a weather window, right? And then also he was at the base of a waterfall, so we had to set up hall systems to get him out of there. So it's, you know, it, it, a lot of times it comes back to, you know, and I, I teach from a wilderness survival standpoint, but let's just take it and just say, hey, when you come out here, let's call it wilderness safety, right? Whether it's wilderness safety, wilderness survival, it's actually really, really boring. It's, you know, they make TV shows about it, but real – wilderness survival is boring. It's about making good decisions and mitigating risks, right? And so 
climbing on a slick waterfall in the summer, right? Well, what's the risk? Well, the risk is that you're going to fall off that and, you know, you know, fracture multiple bones in your bodies. And, you know, then you're going to have potential hypothermia even the summer because now you're a trauma patient and, you know, now you're dealing with that. I mean, it happens every single summer, you know? So like, should I go climb on that waterfall? Well, what's the risk and what's the reward? Well, the risk is, you know, I'm gonna do this. So how can I mitigate that risk? Well, maybe I don't climb up so high, or maybe I, you know, wear good footwear. Or maybe I set up a rope. You know? I'm not saying don't take risk. You know, I'm, trust me, like I'm all about going out and doing adventure sports, but just like being aware of those risks and making educated decisions and trying to mitigate it. I think that's the, the, the good, safe way to do it. Coming from a guy that's got a plate in his head. <laughs> <laughs> what does the prepared outdoor adventure look like to you? Or, or said differently, you know, what do you want people to know before heading out into the backcountry? And I think you touched on that a little bit um, with the, uh, the three courses, you know, the first aid, the land nav, and the, uh, the overnight survival type situation. Um, but on your website, you've got a couple of very useful tools, I think, for folks that they can download and take advantage of. Can you touch on that a little bit for us? Yeah, I think you're talking about the 10 essentials. Correct. The 10 essentials and then the um, stop, think, observe. Yeah, plan act. Yeah, so um, yeah, so the, the stop kind of goes into the mindset, um, you know, the if you're in an actual incident, you know, what you, what you tend to have happen is uh, if someone gets lost, a lot of time uh, they can start to panic, right? So they get the adrenaline dump. And, and so while adrenaline is great uh, to help you, you know, run from a fire or, or fight off a bear, a lot of times it, it just clouds your judgment when you're making these, these decisions. And so uh, one thing that we tell people to do is if, hey, if you are in this situation that you couldn't prevent because you, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, the first thing you want to do is stop, right? You know, if you can sit down, you're going to lo lower your blood pressure. And what I typically try and get people to do is just focus on breathing, right? So you want to calm your, calm your system down, right? You can, if you can control your breathing, you can control your body, you can control your mind, right? So we do box breathing. Uh, the think is just think about your priorities, you know? So like, what are the priorities here? Well, can I get a signal out? Can I call? Um, you know, there's, there's a, in survival is the rule of threes, right? Three minutes without air, three hours without shelter, three days without water, three weeks without food. Well, I like to think of more like a what's important now, like always win, right? And so if you think about that kind of like um, the win priorities, right? First aid may be your first priority, right? How long does it take to someone bleed out from a, you know, arterial bleed, you know? So like deal with, the, deal with what's most important now. Maybe the most important thing right now is immediate shelter because the storm's upon you. Or maybe it's kind of climb up this ridge and get a, a call out on cell phone because it's a, a higher spot, you know. Um, so kind of thinking about all that and making a plan, uh, would, which would be later. And then, you know, the O is for observe. Observe your surroundings and your gear. Um, plan is, you know, go ahead and start making your plan. If it's a group, you want to discuss it. And then the last part is act, right? So plan doesn't do you any good unless you put it into 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 action and then yeah. 10 essentials you can find those anywhere online i won't go over them all but basically you know that guy kind of goes back into that mindset skills and gears you know if you have the right mindset if you've done the training and have the right skills will you back that up and have the right gear you know like i can teach you to go out here and you know survive in the woods naked and, and do all that kind of stuff but like a why you know that's not very um realistic common scenario and B it's a lot of hard work, right? You know, like a lot of people are always asking me like, Oh, if you can only have one item in a survival situation, what would it be? You know, would it be a knife? I'm like, no, it'd be a sleeping bag. Right. Cause in a sleeping bag, I don't have to build a fire. I can, you know, lay in it if I'm injured. You know, we had a guy uh, back in, you know, around 2000 laid in his sleeping bag for three days up on the Appalachian trail. He ended up losing his, toes from frostbite but you know like he's alive if he tried to build a shelter in those environments he'd be dead you know so sleeping bags a, a life-saving piece of gear you know and it kind of goes back to you know if, if you look at uh how these survival situations happen is like the majority of them happen to day hikers and it's like well why did they happen well if you're out on a backpacking trip and you get caught out an extra night well you've got your sleeping bag you got your tent you know you probably got your stove maybe you're out of food but it's no big deal. Maybe you just go hungry at night. But if you're out on a day hike and bad weather rolls in, well, you don't have your tent, your sleeping bag, and all that kind of stuff. So 
preparing for that overnight and whatever the weather conditions are is really that's the that's the big crux for me when I teach. Awesome. You know, you mentioned something there that maybe a lot of people might not be familiar with um, as part of the uh, the pause breathe, um, and that's box breathing. And that's um, for those who don't know, that's a, it's a breathing pattern, a breathing system, right? Where you you breathe in, maybe let's say a four or five count in, four or five count hold, exhale, and hold again. And you, you know it's very very effective at controlling your your sympathetic um, responses and keeping yourself uh, in a very calm mental state. Um, if somebody wants more information on that, I, I would direct them to um, a real quick place to go would be um, YouTube. Look up uh, Mark Divine or Seal Fit Unbeatable Mind. They've got some uh, some videos there to help you out with that. It's very powerful. All right. So if people wanted to learn more about or, um, you know, support you guys in some way, what's the best way to go about doing that? Our website, which is teambusar.org. Busar is with B-U-S-A-R. You can learn more about, about our team. Certainly the, um, the, the, the tips there, the 10 essentials, more information about stop as well as a trip plan. Examples of that are, are all there. Um, certainly you can also, our contact information where you can make donations certainly is, is there. Yeah, I would add to that is like, you know, um, a, I would call him a mentor once told me in this, in this industry, he said, you know, we don't rescue people with ropes and, and helicopters and all that stuff. He said, we rescue them with money because it takes money to get that gear. It takes money to provide the training. It takes money to, uh, you know, just get people up here to, to do what we're doing, you know, and that's, that's, that's the name of the game. So, you know, I think the, the good thing about our organization and I've seen it with donors is, you know, like donors are heroes too. And so like one of our big donors from Florida, she came up, I'm like, Hey, look, you know, here's where your, your money went is like, this person is alive because, uh, you know, the money that you gave to our organization and you can just see it sink in like, Oh yeah, you know, like, it's, it's a pretty big deal, you know? So, I would say that too, you know, when you, when you're, whether it's our organization or another one, if you're listening across the country, you know, like when you search and rescue team, like that money is going to save someone's life and you are going to become part of that team at that point. So maybe you can't be out there physically, but you're out there. Yeah. You really can't overemphasize that enough. Can't do it without out the money and it definitely directly saves lives. Um, Andrew, do you want to talk a little bit about in the last few minutes here, um, your, your, or what you do on the side or your, your business with training? Yeah, sure. Um, I run a school called Big Pig Outdoors and you can find me at bigpigoutdoors.com. And, uh, the, um, I, I guess, you know, I grew up in, uh, wilderness survival is like, Hey, I'm going to be this mountain man and do all this kind of stuff. So I went through this kind of like primitive living skills phase where I ran around and, you know, loincloth and barefoot making arrowheads. And then I went through this craft phase where I went to Canada and I trained with all the guys there and I wore wool shirts and built big fires. And then I started working for the park service about 20 years ago. And what I saw is that all the stuff I'd learned in Boy Scouts and read in books and all that kind of stuff, when it comes to, you know, real world survival experiences, um, it just wasn't playing out. And so uh, in 2013, I started up my own uh, outdoor school. And so what I look at is taking my search and rescue experience and combining it with my um, professional hunting experience and wildland firefighting and all the other outdoor jobs I've had and coming up with a program uh, that uh, kind of is a realistic program. So you're not going to be making baskets and uh, brain tan buckskin in my, in my class, but you are going to learn how to deal with, uh, you know, cold water immersion. You are going to learn how to, deal with multiple life-threatening injuries, how to spend the night out in really nasty weather, um, how to build fire when it's 40 degrees and raining. So I only teach those classes during the winter time because I need those conditions um, to make it really nasty. And uh, that's what I like. Uh, and and, and the, the, the side benefit of that is coming from a law enforcement background is how we train law enforcement, how we train military is in you know, reality-based scenario trainings. And so when you are in that situation in real life, you're like, oh, it's no big deal. I've, I've been there and done that before when in training. So uh, currently I teach the survival classes. I teach land navigation. Um, I teach, uh, I've been teaching some wilderness, uh, like foraging classes. I've kind of haven't been teaching those lately as much. Um, 
and then we're looking at starting a wilderness first aid class through my business as well. And then I teach some tracking classes, but custom classes, I'll do anything. Like I do a lot of custom training for different organizations. Um, but yeah, the meat and potatoes are the survival class and the land navigation class. And I hope to offer wilderness first aid class. So that way you one stop shop, you can come get all three things that you need to be safe out in the outdoors. So. Awesome. All right. And Matt, what's, what's, uh, what's on your agenda? What's next for you? Any adventure races coming up or, uh, I just came back. I just got back from Moab. Just, uh, do, love Moab. I haven't had time to plan my next, my next adventure, but, um, I'm in the process of finishing their 900 miles of maintained trails in the, in the Smokies. And, um, I hope to finish those in the next month and a half. Very nice. Awesome. Yeah, we're uh, we're big fans of Moab. We love the uh, that area, the San Rafael Swell. Done a lot of canyoneering back in that area. So love it. Beautiful. Love it. Um, and then one more time, best way for people to contact you. Teamboostar.org. Gentlemen, thank you both for taking the time out from your busy Saturday training day training day uh, to chat with us. We truly appreciate you and what you do.